Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1. You are going to listen to the director of a college talking about his school. Listen to the talk and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Many of you already have a reasonably firm idea of the general subject area you wish to study. Others are more open and searching for ideas. Whatever your situation, I hope you find that we have a course that meets your needs. Our firm aim is to be a student-centred institution with a special emphasis on flexibility. This begins with our attitude to access. We judge people on their motivation and commitment to study as much as, if not more than, formal qualifications. This is reflected in the vitality and diversity of our student population. Some of our students come direct from sixth form or college. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Others are coming into higher education after a short or long gap from formal education. Some are seeking a specific set of skills with a particular job or profession in mind. Others are retraining or studying to give their careers a new direction or dimension. Some are learning about the very latest scientific, technological and commercial knowledge. Others are stretching their minds on sensitive environmental, social and cultural issues. Even a casual observation of the mix of our student body indicates that we're close to our aim of being a polytechnic for the whole community. To meet our students' needs, we have 500 academic and a further 500 support staff committed to good quality teaching, high standards and sensitive and sympathetic student care. We have probably the longest experience of understanding and dealing with the differing needs of a diverse student population. I hope you'll find a suitable course at the Polytechnic College if you want to come to the college and we consider you suitable, we'll do our best to find you a place. And when you're here, we'll work hard to make your experience enjoyable, stimulating and educationally rewarding. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between a prospective student and a university advisor about applying to enter the university. First, look at questions 11 to 13.
As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 13. I'm interested in entering your business administration program, and I'd like some information on how to apply. I'm a little concerned because I've been out of school for a number of years. That could actually work to your advantage. It's possible to get academic credit for work experience if that experience is related to courses in our program. I've been working in business for several years. How would I get academic credit for that? First, you'll need to read the university catalogue to see if any of the course descriptions match your specific job experience. For example, if you've worked in accounting, you may be able to get credit for an accounting course. So, then what would I do? You would write a summary of your work experience, relating it to specific courses we offer. Submit that to the admissions office with a letter from your work supervisor confirming your experience. Now look at questions 14 to 20. As the interview continues, Would I submit those things at the same time that I apply for admission? That would be the best idea. Have you seen a copy of our university catalogue? Not the most recent one. I have a copy from last year. You'll need to look at the latest one. Unfortunately, I've run out of copies, but you can get one from the library for now, and I'll send you your own copy as soon as I have more available. Thank you. How does the admissions process work? Well, first you'll need to get an application for admission. Those are available in the admissions office. The application form contains all the instructions you'll need. That sounds simple enough. Of course. You'll need to make sure you meet all the admissions requirements. How can I know what those are? We have copies of the requirements lists for all university programs here in the counselling centre. I'll give you one before you leave today. Will I need to get recommendations from my employer or former teachers? Oh, yes, you will. The recommendation forms are available in the admissions office. Now, I don't know if you'll also be applying for a part-time job through the university work-study program. I'm considering that. How can I find out what kinds of jobs are offered? You can access the job listings from the computers in the library. Are you planning to study full-time or part-time? I want to be a full-time student. Good. Then you'll qualify for the work-study program. Part-time students aren't eligible. As a full-time student, would I be eligible for a free bus pass? No, unfortunately. We don't have those available for any of our students. However, you can apply for financial assistance to help pay for your books or for your tuition. I'd like to look into that. Do I apply for that at the admissions office? No, that's through us. You'll need to make an appointment with a counsellor. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two business studies students discussing a presentation they'll do on an article on working effectively in groups. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. So, Brad, what did you think of the article on group work? Oh, hi, Helen. Uh, yeah, it was pretty good, with helpful pieces of advice on how to make group work effective. I think we were lucky to be given such a straightforward text to present at the Management Skills Seminar. Yeah. Actually, shall we discuss it now? Have you got time? Sure. It's only a 10-minute presentation, so we just need to explain and then give our views on the main points raised in the article. I'll jot down some notes. Right. So, there are three main sections. I suggest we start with listening. Yeah, effective listening in groups, because it's not something that's frequently covered on courses in our field. No, and we should say that in the presentation. Yeah. And also, effective listening's pretty simple, you know. I don't think it's hard to learn. Well, people think it's easy, but in my experience, most of us tend to be very lazy listeners. OK, I wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> Something I do think we should emphasize is the power of the listener's posture, gestures, etc., in making speakers feel respected. Not that you're just waiting for them to finish before jumping in with your own ideas. Uh-huh. OK, right. Uh, the next section is on goal setting. Let's make sure we're clear what the article says on this. Yeah. Well, firstly, it says that all group members must be given time to explain their own goals. That's it, yeah. And then did it say that the whole group should agree on common goals? That's a bit too strong. It's more that everyone's agendas should be equally acceptable. But it does say that goals have to be realistic, you know... Achievable within a particular time? You've got it. That's really what the article's saying. There isn't really any point in having ideals if group members know they won't come to anything within a reasonable period. So, I think a summary covering those points will be enough for that part of the presentation, don't you? Yep. Yeah. Now, the last section is about conflict resolution. Actually, I thought it was the worst part of the article. Me too. I don't think it went into sufficient detail on the issue. Actually, I thought it devoted too much space to it, but that it was all rather boring, you know? It didn't mention some of the more radical theories. Absolutely. I found that really irritating. Right. And also, I think it could have said more about conflict sometimes being healthy in groups. Absolutely. It just mentioned rather glibly about how we should avoid thinking of winners and losers and that quick resolution of conflict is always desirable. Without explaining what these terms mean? Well, it gives quite detailed definitions, but doesn't develop a proper argument. Right. So for the presentation, I think we just give some definitions and... And then explain what we felt were the weaknesses in the article's treatment of conflict resolution. Yeah, good. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, let's think about what we have to prepare for the actual presentation. Well, I suppose we'll use PowerPoint, but I'm hopeless at using it, especially if it has any visuals. I really have to look into doing a course on it because I know I'll need it in the future. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm quite happy using PowerPoint and I'll put it together when everything else is ready. That's a relief. But yes, do that later. OK. Now, I heard the tutor saying we have to include some well-chosen quotations from the article. I'm not sure if we do. I'll email him to find out. No need. I can just have a look at the specs he gave us when he set the task. That'll be quicker. But the tutor definitely said we have to prepare a handout to go with the talk. I'm not really sure how we do that. Sarah did one last year. Who's she? She's doing the same option as me on marketing. I'll ask her advice on what to include. Great. So that just leaves the bibliography at the end. I suppose it'll mainly be articles. Yeah. So we'll just look on the web, and we can leave that till later. But we've been advised against that. 
Well, we could have a look through some journals in the library. I think we should start by looking through module handbooks. I think that'll give us some good leads. Yeah, you're probably right. So, that's all the topics. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about geotourism. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 31 to 34. Now, I'd like to move on to talk about something called geotourism. Geotourism is, very basically, leveraging the benefits of tourism for local communities. I would just like to give you a couple of statistics which are very illustrative of the current situation with regard to young travellers and international tourism. Firstly, tourism has an impact on more people worldwide than any other industry. Indeed, it has an impact on one in every two people, either directly or indirectly. The second statistic is that in global tourism, there is a 97% economic leakage. This means that if you spend £100 on going on holiday, normally only £3 of that money will actually reach the people who are giving you the services and the accommodation, for example, in the destination. If you put these two figures together, you can understand why some of the regions of the world which have very high levels of tourism still have very high levels of poverty and huge developmental challenges. These countries have this massive industry demanding a huge number of services, but they are not seeing a fair reward for these services. Geotourism is about changing this. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 35 to 40. Projects are now being developed with financial organisations such as the World Bank. One of these involves developing a technology platform which is bringing grassroots travel products such as hotels, locally owned hotels, not global chains, very locally owned tour operators to the international travel market, therefore avoiding the middlemen. These middlemen often cut them out of the market completely or just make their business unsustainable. Another way that geotourism can be promoted is through the niche travel market of volunteering. These days, a significant number of older teenagers want to spend a gap year, either between school and university, or university and employment. Often, these people want to spend some or all of their year volunteering, but they either don't have the money or don't feel inclined to pay the main volunteering organisation businesses the fee they require, which can be as high as £3,500. What they are looking for is an organisation who can connect them with people on the ground, who can suggest worthwhile local projects. So, this is a real win-win scenario. The organisers charge a small flat fee, which then goes to the local contact. 
thus, the local contact gets a very good commission just for one customer. The customer is also saving a large amount of money and time, both of which they can give to the projects they end up working on. There is still quite a long way to go before poverty in the most popular of tourist areas is eradicated, but a focus on this type of geotourism could provide an answer. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.